thank you for the uh, festival for uh, having us speak. Um, I'm from the University of San Francisco. I, I would like to dedicate this talk to Riza Sarhani. Some of us know him as founder of the Bridges Conference, and he had passed away this year, so um, this is dedicated to him. So you don't have a microphone? Oh. today is images generated by the algorithm used to create the Koch curve. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, these images look uh, familiar, but uh, the algorithm in the top right essentially says we can define a recursive algorithm for producing this Koch curve by tar starting at a point, which is the dark black dot, moving forward a certain length, turning 60 degrees counterclockwise, moving forward again, turn 240 degrees counterclockwise, move forward, and then turn 60 again and move forward, and we get this first image here. What the second image is, if you take each of those four segments and recursively do that procedure with segments one third of the length, then you get the second iteration of the Koch curve, and third iteration, fourth, fifth, sixth. And I had a student early last year sent an email to the math faculty at the university asking does someone know about fractals he wanted to learn about them for designing images for a psychology experiment and I said yes I do and he asked a you know very interesting but naive question he says well what if we change those angles and if we change the central angle to 245 instead of 240 we get this kind of behavior, but notice we kind of destroy that linear nature here, right? Because this is this is iterations one, two, three, and four. And if we change the first and third angles to 65 degrees, we get one, two, three, and fourth iterations here. So what you'll notice is once you change angles even by a slight amount, you're going to find that there's interesting inter-self intersecting behavior happening. Uh, these are some images I have shown at some other conferences. This is using angles, if you look down at the caption, uh, 0 and 12. So I go forward, forward again, turn 12 degrees, forward and forward again, and iterate that. And then take some segment of this. This is, uh, this is not the complete image. Um, some things like the Koch curve actually don't close up, right? They just keep going on uh, recursively forever. Uh, this is an image using angles of 11 and 191 degrees, which those of you going to bridges will see it there. And then here's a couple others. This one has symmetry, if you notice. There's rotational symmetry to this image. Rotational symmetry to this image as well. And uh, what we want to take a look at in general, if we extend the algorithm used to generate the Koch curve to the first and third angles being given and the central angle being given, what happens when we iterate this recursively? Will the image actually close? And we're going to look at a partial solution to that today. Here's an example where the image actually does close. And uh, I'll explain a little bit more about what these mean later, but the p equals 336 means the subdivision of the circle into 360 degrees is arbitrary. We can use any number of points to subdivide. So what I want to talk about is how we actually get a handle on answering that question. This is a simple example of angles of 40 and 60 degrees, which I have shown so we can take a look at things easily. Um, what this chart is, uh, reading across, it's the incremental number of degrees we're at. So I start at 0, I add 40, then I add 60, then I add 40 to get the 140. I recurse with the 40, and then I get a 40, 60, 40 again, and what essentially this is, is a track of the cumulative angle at which we're rotating. The idea here is that this recursive algorithm actually generates these images in an iterative format, 
So if you take a look at, let's see. So let, let me tell you how this image is generated. It's going to go forward 40, then 60, then 40, turn 40, 60, 40, and then 60, 40, and back here. Then we're going to actually go around the second arm. It's going to go around like this. But the interesting thing is the next eight segments will actually retrace this second arm a second time. Then it will move to the third arm. So what we're, we're seeing happens um, is that we basically are going around, and then around, then around again, then around again, moving around these arms, sometimes retracing the arm we previously drew. What these numbers do is keeps track of our cumulative angle turns. And the very first naive observation to make is if we actually close up and start over again, one of these angle sums must be zero, right? Because I'm going to start all over again. And in fact, we do have a zero right here, but you'll notice that zeros and 180s can actually come from different places. That uh, if we go around here, you see this arm, that there's uh, going to be a zero going right here to here, even though we're not starting back at the origin. So what, we're, what our approach is, is to try to analyze this in an iterative way. And by looking at this chart, if you, if you notice some of the patterns, um, if you notice this algorithm is going 40, 60, 40, right, 40, 60, 40, then it's applying the recursion and then you're going to see another 40, 60, 40. All the first, second, and third increments are going to be 40, 60, 40, but that inter-row angle will depend upon where it occurs in the recursive procedure. You'll notice that several of these are opposites, right? That you see here the angle of 100 here, and I'm having an angle of 280 over here. And so an angle of 100 and 280 are going to go in opposite directions. They're going to cancel each other out, which is a significant point. Um, some arms are retraced, and the question is which arms are retraced, and we'll actually answer that today. And then what is the symmetry of this object? And we'll see later this number is significant. If I take my two angles, 60 minus 40 is 20, and uh, divide 360 by 20, I order 18 symmetry. And we won't be able to take a look at the proofs. The proofs are all in the paper. I just want to be able to state the theorem here. Um, I should point out the organization of these numbers into this chart was by no means obvious. It took it staring at hundreds and thousands of angles in Mathematica to try to find a way that gave me some insight numerically into what's going on. Okay, so this is the general issue is we have a recursive procedure, and as we replace each one of these Fs with another copy of this multiple times, we essentially have some iterative sequence of angles that we're using. So we need to decide for each turn, is it an alpha 0 or an alpha 1? And once we have this sequence of angles, that completely determines what image is drawn. And here is how we determine that. If we call tau of k is the parity of the highest power of 2, which is a factor of k, then theta k is alpha tau of k. Meaning, um, and maybe it's best to go right to the next slide. So he, here's a chart of tau values. So 6, for example, is 2 to the first times 3. The power of 2 is odd, so it's a 1. Here for 20, 2 to the 2 squared times 5, the power of 2 is even, so we have a 0. 32, 2 to the 5th times 1, power of 5 is odd, so we have a 1. What this means is my sequence of angles goes alpha 0, alpha 1, in other words, 40, 60, 40, 40, 40, 60, 40, 60, 40, 60. And so what this proposition does is basically tells us exactly the angle at which we'll be rotating next. This is an example uh, where, again, we're at 336 parts and dividing using 149 and 189 of those parts respectively.
Okay. Now, we're not going to be able to go into the whys of all this. That comes in the proof. But the important element here is the 180. What's going to make the theorem true is that this first number, the second row, is essentially half the number of parts the circle is divided into. I won't be able to say why that is, but I'll just have to refer you to the paper here. But I want to explain how we can formally describe what we're looking for. How do we say that the first number in the second row is 180? Well, I've added the 40, the 60, the 40, and I have a 40 from the end of the first row. So that's what's happening here. And I'm taking mod 360 because obviously as I go around the circle, that when I'm in excess of 360, I'm moving along the same angle. So here we are. I'm trying to be careful with this thing. So I have 40, 60, 40, 40. That's three 40s and 160. Now, where does that 60 come from? Remember, 60 is alpha 1. So I want to know which values give me a 1. Remember my sequence of 1s and zeros? I want to know how many of these are 1. And that's precisely what this capital T says. It's summing up from 1 to k how many 1s I have. That's how many 60s. And the rest are 40s. So this actually is t of 4. It's how many 1s between 1 and 4. This is how many are left because I have a 4 minus that. Another theorem you can prove is that, as we'll see in a moment, that 4 minus t of 4 is actually t of 8. And this generalizes as well. And what we have is rewriting this statement as t of 8 times 40 plus t of 4 times 60 is 180. And that gives us this statement here. And essentially where that comes to in a general case, if I take a circle divided into p parts, and p is going to be even here, and I take alpha naught and alpha one of them, so four in degrees, that's how many degrees I'm at. And if we have each arm, remember that these rows were in rows of four, and eight segments drew an arm. It turns out that if we, we can use an arbitrary power of two here. So if I have two to the q segments in each arm, and then if alpha naught and alpha one satisfy this Diophantine equation, it turns out that we can prove that the curve actually closes up. So what it's going to be about here is how do we solve this particular equation. Here's another example where I have the circle divided into 336 parts with 2 to the 6 is 64 parts in each arm. Um, I don't know, I just, these images look really, really interesting. You'll notice I kept everything in black and white for this presentation. Um, even on the, on the computer screen, it actually is even more intriguing. Just the textures you get just by using this iterative algorithm, I think, are really very interesting. Okay, um, I don't think we need to dwell in this in great detail. In order to solve this, we need some facts about this t of 2q. And here are some facts that, again, are proved uh, in the paper. And this is where some number theory comes in. Since these two numbers are relatively prime, we have actually p solutions to this linear equation. And this tells us the order of symmetry. Uh, and if you remember back from the previous example, we have 360 parts. Our angles were 60 and 40. And if we take 360 over the greatest common divisor of 20 and 360, then I actually get 18. So we can actually recover the symmetry as well. Uh, since I had this paper submitted, I've actually been able to work out all the symmetries that are possible for a given number of parts. And I'm almost at the point of being able to calculate um, how many of each symmetry. But that will be for, for some future work. Okay, here's another example with, again, p equals 336. <coughs> I don't want to go into a lot of details about the solution. If you've solved some equations in number theory, this will look very familiar. But um, if we have this is the same linear equation, and there's just some very standard techniques to solve it. And in this case, we have solutions. We can actually list out all the solutions. This is alpha naught. This is alpha 1. 
and let k go from 0 to 336. So for this talk, I actually was looking at solutions of this form. And then you can do some number theory calculations. If I want to just substitute this alpha naught and alpha 1 in my symmetry equation, I get the order of my symmetry is given by this expression. And I specifically wanted to have images with order 42 symmetry, meaning I wanted that denominator to be equal to 1. And then I basically, if you count how many of those things are possible, a simple inclusion-exclusion argument gives you 192 solutions. It turns out they come in, uh, they come in pairs. So, Again, these are some standard techniques in number theory to solve linear equations, but they're easily solvable. And we could, add, and I use Mathematica to do this, right? You just say, okay, give me all the solutions and all the angle pairs, and I can generate images that way. This is one of my favorites. Uh, I just love these indented structures here. You know, it's every, every one is a surprise. You just don't know what you're going to get until you actually uh, print it out. It's really a lot of fun to play with. Um, turns out the theorem that the kth arm is retraced when tau of k is 1. Remember, tau was the parity of the highest power of 2. So, because I have 42 fold symmetry and some of those arms are retraced, it turns out we need 63 arms because it turns out 21 of those are retraced because there's 21 numbers between, zero, between 1 and 63 which have a tau value of 1. So I can actually determine exactly what arms are retraced uh, when we make that image. And because some of the arms are retraced, that's giving some natural texture to these images, which, I mean, all, all I do is I set the line width. That's the only parameter I need to set, and I can get the, some of the interesting textures in these images. Uh, here's another one. Uh, again, these interesting layers of circles. I wish I could tell you I could design these. I don't know how to do that yet. I would like to know how to predict something about this behavior from the parameters, but I think that's a more complicated question. Okay, a few open questions and directions uh, to go. Um, that uh, in terms of the images produced by this theorem, they all close up. It's very easy to show when alpha 0 is equal to alpha 1, I either get a regular polygon or a star polygon but I have not found any image generated by this procedure to give me anything else. Now, it sounds like it's a hard question to ask, um, because if you think about it, the way the P is chosen and the alpha naught and alpha 1, I'm basically taking rational multiples of pi for my angles. What if you have irrational multiples of pi? What if things don't go in opposite directions to cancel out? Are there other ways to cancel? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Here's another one with the, uh, these points here. Again, why? Um, future plans. Uh, again, this is, if you think about it, this is the most naive way of altering this algorithm. Just change those two angles. We can change the length as well, or have three different angles. Of course, explore the use of color. As I said, the texture to me was interesting enough that I didn't feel a need to use color. And then um, another exciting thing is that this fall, I'll actually be teaching a first year seminar course for freshmen called Mathematics and Digital Art. And here is um, my math blog, and I've written about half the post this past year for that purpose. But these are going to be freshmen with no computer science or math background just general first year course, and I'm going to be talking about these images and using iterated function systems and having them make movies with processing. I will be uh, posting weekly or bi-weekly updates on my website and having resources from my blog, also taking papers from Symmetry and Bridges conferences, so everything will be online, so anyone interested in following is certainly welcome to do that and use whatever I have. I mean, it's uh, putting it up there so we can kind of Put out the word that you know the interface of mathematics and programming and art can generate some really interesting interesting things. Uh, just another very intriguing image with these spindly things sticking out. Um, 
And here is my website. If you want to see some more of my digital my artwork here, I have a blog, Twitter, email. Feel free to uh, contact me about uh, any of these things. And uh, and then here's another one that again. This is higher order symmetry than 42. Um, but uh, and anyone who's interested who does have a Mathematica or um, I've used Postscript to generate these as well, but just email me. I'll share with you whatever whatever I've got. Um, it's not a sophisticated algorithm. It just basically does a bunch of four words and turns, but you can generate a lot of interesting things in that way. Okay, thank you. Because I, I would think it being a computer generating the angles, it would like retrace exactly and it wouldn't add anything. Else. Okay, so the question is how, how am I getting texture by arms being retraced by the computer? Because if it's just retracing over the same lines, isn't it? Well, it turns out it's not actually true. If, if you if you iterate these more and more and more, they will actually get wider and wider and wider. Because. And yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, and that's, it's, it's a purely an artifice of technology. <laughs> it's a nice artifice of technology. Yes, no, I was, I was quite, quite pleased by it. What involves the fact that oh. the What involves the fact that dimensional of this subject? The question is not, what about... <laughs> What about the fractal dimension of this object? Well, it would just be one, because it's just a series of, it's a finite, it's a line of finite length. Um, now, what happens is, uh, the question would be very interesting, is some of these, oops. Okay. <clears throat> like some of these that exhibit more chaotic behavior, and that don't actually close up, what happens. And they still would be linear, so you'd probably still have a fractal dimension of one for the segment, but if you look at the set of points in the plane, you know, the question is, what, do, what does that look like? And, and, I, and maybe after, you know, you know, I don't even know when they close up or not, even to be able to answer that. Yes, so you iterate, yeah, what happened is, the, uh, my initial naive algorithm was to plug in random numbers and see what happened, right? And then once I started to see that sometimes these images closed up, it's, the question you ask is, well, why? And how can I generate other ones that exhibit the same behavior? I have a question. Yes. Oh, I'll try to just yell loud. <laughs> What, what is the significance of 336? I know it's twice 168, which is the uh, which is the number of the order of uh, a, um, a simple group. But uh, aside from the fact, aside from the fact that it has a lot of divisors, it's uh, uh, three times seven times 16. Is there any significance? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, well, the, 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 uh, the slightly longer answer is um, that this was order 18, and these had segments. Um, uh, I was having things with all the images on the um, initial slide. These are all of order 18 using degrees. And I wanted to create something of a higher order with more segments of the arms to try to get some more texture. and. Uh, I don't know if any of you are numerologists, but I think 42 is a particularly interesting number. And so I wanted it to have 42 full symmetry, and, and so I picked 336 and, and as a way to get things that would have 42 full symmetry. Could you generalize this uh, procedure for three dimensional cases? Uh, yes, please do it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, I, I think because you, this is a, right, all you need is any orthogonal matrix here, right? You don't need a rotation in the plane and, uh, and, and see what you generate. But yes, this could definitely, and of course, the, 
there's no reason why you could only have three instances of this and these Fs have to be the same length. You could use any L system that you wanted to to generate these images. But uh, I just found that using this naive algorithm, the, the analysis was pretty straightforward. I think if you went into higher dimensions, it would be much more difficult. And so they call that? Right? Oh, color. Oh, yes. This, you know, the sky is the limit. <laughs> A seven, a two, and a three. This was my driving factor. Here. But, yeah. And in fact, I played with 2016 this morning just for fun. But you know, yeah, you could you could play that game all you, all you like. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, my name is Doug Dunham, and I'm going to talk about um, these random uh, patterns that we made, uh, but it turns out that there is an argument in the, uh, in the process that actually can control the amount of symmetry that we have. This particular uh, pattern here doesn't have any particular kinds of symmetry. I'll try to make this more I try to uh, uh, emphasize this a little bit more later on. On the other hand, it's going to be warm here in the next few days, so if you take a look at these snowflakes, maybe it'll cool you off. Uh, this is a brief background. Uh, I'll describe uh, the algorithm, and, and then going on down, I'll particularly look at, uh, there are a couple of parameters. Uh, C and N, and C in particular uh, t seems to have some control over the degree of symmetry, at least in some of the patterns. And if I have some extra time at the end, I'll, I'll show some other patterns. Uh, so the original uh, goal was just to uh, create a, a fractal uh, pattern of, of ever smaller motifs. Uh, fractal patterns should look uh, the same at any scale of magnification. Uh, and in order to do this, because of our algorithm making each of the, the, the copies of our, our motifs, such as the snowflake, making it smaller, uh, we get this effect. And uh, it, it turns out that uh, after experimenting, I mean, you might think if you wanted to fill a region with pros prospectively, uh, with progressively smaller motifs, that their areas should be uh, maybe decrease exponentially. Well, uh, my colleague, it turned out, tried this, and it didn't work. What happened was the algorithm would halt. Uh, it couldn't find any space for the next uh, motif. Uh, and so he kept modifying it by having segments that were uh, that were um, that were geometric uh, series like that, and and then when he finally got that to work by by just taking chunks of geometric series, he plotted them on a log log scale and noticed that uh, they were approximated by a, a straight line, which indicated that the underlying rule should be. A, uh, a power, and so he came up with this this formula, this formulation here, 
and the, the, if the hyph motif has area capital A sub I, oops, where is the, looking for the, can't see, I was just trying to point out that, let's see, where is the, oh, okay, got it. So, uh, yeah, the region that we want to fill is, an, is a, a region R. You can think of it as being a rectangle, and, and A is its area. So we want to fill that uh, rec rectangle entirely, and the, the areas of each of the little pieces uh, should be given by this formula, some constant uh, times A divided by uh, N plus I to the power C. That gives the power rule. And it turns out in order for this to be true, this constant here uh, is the so-called Hurwitz zeta function. It's uh, the same as the ordinary, it's a generalization of the ordinary uh, zeta function uh, where, um, uh, where Q is equal to zero. Uh, and uh, just because of the, the calculation here, uh, oops, just because of the calculation, uh, the, the sum of the areas is equal to, to the total area of the region, which is what, our, which we, which is what we desired. So we call this the, the area rule. And so the algorithm just uh, works by just uh, taking a random placement inside the region R and trying to put a copy of a motif there. Uh, and this is called a trial. Now the trial may not be successful because it might uh, intersects some previously placed motif. We, we keep a, an array of such motifs. Uh, and on the other hand, if it misses everything we previously put, then we call this a successful placement. Uh, and so we can, this is a, an example of how the, a pictorial example of how uh, the algorithm works. In this particular example, we don't have, we don't fill with a whole bunch of circles because I just want to show uh, how it starts out, but in this particular example, we use a value of c equals uh, 1.3. Incidentally, c should be greater than 1, and it uh, turns out that there's an upper limit depending on the, uh, both the, the region and the, uh, the motif, kind of motif we use, uh, and it's usually uh, somewhere around 1.5, maybe less. More complicated patterns, a lot less. And N, the dependence on N doesn't seem to be uh, as uh, critical. So I want to create this, this pattern, at least the starting uh, point of this pattern. In, in the limit, of course, we'd have the entire uh, big circle filled with land. But uh, so here are 21 uh, circles. And if we start, uh, obviously, we're going to, to get this circle as our first circle. And in fact, no problem with putting that circle. There aren't any other circles that intersect, so it works just fine. Uh, if we try to place a second circle, where there's a lot of room, and the second circle is going to be smaller, way too fast there. So uh, the second. Can't, can't make it go back. Oh, well, let's see if I can make it go forward. So what happens is here, this is where the second circle goes. This is where I try to put the third circle right here. And obviously, uh, it's not going to work because it overlaps the previously placed circle. So I try to I try again. Well, this is better because it's not entirely within a circle, but it still intersects a previously placed circle. So that doesn't work either. So I try again, and boy, this is similar to the last one. That didn't work either. But I get lucky on my fourth try, and, uh, and then the circle gets placed. And I repeat this process, and it turns out that I have to repeat the process uh, 245 times in order to get just 21 circles. In fact, the number of, the number of, uh, the number of uh, 
the number of trials that I have to make increases uh, it increases polynomially uh, with uh, with uh, the number of motifs that I place so far. This is a, a flow chart for the algorithm. Uh, my colleague is a former uh, Fortran programmer and thinks this way, so he gave me this. Um, now, my colleague has made many runs of this program, probably in the order of 10,000, uh, and uh, he has always been able to find uh, values of C and capital N such that the program doesn't halt. And, uh, and actually by experimentation, uh, if, a, if the program is going to halt, it will typically halt uh, before, uh, before the number of motifs gets to be 200. In fact, it, it usually stops at about four or five. Uh, let's see. And actually this, uh, this program has been implemented in, in other dimensions too. Uh, one dimension is not too interesting. Uh, uh, dimension two is what I'm going to show. Dimension, the problem with dimensions three and four is that you can't see what's behind the motifs that are so-called in front, at least in the case of four dimensions. And uh, there's some, the, the, the fractal dimensions uh, have been calculated uh, for one dimension and for uh, two dimensions to be one over C and two over C. I think, of, I don't know that it's been calculated in three dimensions, but the conjecture is that it's the dimension divided by C in, in D dimension space. Uh, now just by looking at this formula uh, for the area rule, we can see that as uh, C increases or N decreases, there is a larger difference in the size of the first uh, few motifs. And the converse is also true. Uh, in fact, as C decreases uh, toward one, the size of the motifs become uh, ever smaller, in fact, become points of the limit. Uh, and so the, the fractal dimension as C equals zero is just the dimension of a, uh, a region filled with points, a two-dimensional region filled with points, so the fractal dimension is also two. And this, is, this shows a, a sample of various values of C and N. I'm not going to really concentrate this on, on the, uh, the the value of C, as I say, the algorithm seems to be much more dependent on C than, than N. There's, uh, for any particular combination of region and motif, uh, there seems to be a, a parameter value of C max beyond which the, the algorithm always halts. And actually, it's sort of fuzzy. So there's actually two uh, upper limits. Uh, one is the first time that everything, or the first time, the first one is when uh, some uh, patterns halt, and the second one is when all of the patterns halt, and they're usually pretty close together. And I say, so I say for symmetric, pretty symmetric uh, uh, regions and motifs, it's close to about 1.5. Now. The real point that I really want to make, the, 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 uh, the tie-in of these kinds of patterns and symmetry is it turns out that the value of C seems to determine the amount of symmetry. And in particular, the lower values of C are more random, the higher values of C uh, seem to be more symmetric. And unfortunately, we don't have very many examples of this. Uh, and measures of, of symmetry, uh, well, that, I think this will become clear in, after the examples here, but this is what happens if we use circles. Incidentally, uh, for circles, uh, in this case, uh, we, we both have a circular region and it's filled with circles. Uh, probably the highest value of C is, is pretty close to 1.5. There, there 
simple uh, regions, simple motifs. Notice that uh, the value uh, on the uh, the value on the left here is 1.24, which is actually pretty high for for some kinds of patterns, but it seems to be pretty random where the uh, circles of different sizes are. Uh, so a little bit more, uh, you can see that the, the second, third, fourth, fifth uh, are coming around, sort of around the edges here. Uh, so as C is increased to 1.32, it's becoming a little more symmetric. Uh, and then I'll jump uh, all the way to, uh, uh, to 1.48, and this pattern here, it, it looks almost uh, like uh, uh, like Apollonian circles, and, and uh, here is the ap uh, sample Apollonian sample uh, for comparison. So, it, so my conjecture would be that the fractal dimension of this Apollonian, this pattern of Apollonian circles, is probably close to uh, 1.5, although. For different Apollonian, for different uh, arrangements of Apollonian circles, you get different fractal dimensions. So that's that's circles inside circles. Uh, here is uh, squares inside a square, <coughs> and here we see sort of a similar pattern in that uh, for uh, and again, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for squares uh, we. Uh, because they're a simple pattern and uh, they're in a simple region, we'd expect fairly high uh, C values to work. And in fact, that's the case here. Uh, we start off with relatively, uh, rel oops, relatively, relatively low value of C, uh, 1.16. Uh, this does appear to be pretty random. Uh, maybe things are packing together a little more uh, carefully when uh, the, the C value goes up to 132. I believe the number of squares is the same in all of these. And then when we increase uh, C to be near its maximum, uh, we get this pattern on the right. The pattern on the right is, is reminiscent of, of patterns that you get uh, for these uh, this problem of squaring the square when you try to fill a square with uh, a square of in integer side integer side squares where the, all the integers of the interior squares have to be different. Uh, I think probably people have seen that. Um, it would be interesting to. Unfortunately, we don't have any examples where that goes to infinity. But if we did, it would be interesting to find out what the fractal dimension of that is. This is one case where we really do have uh, all the numbers we need, and that is when we, uh, when we fill a triangle with triangles. Again, triangles are, are fairly simple objects. All the triangles, though, have the same orientation. That does put some restriction on it. And uh, the, the results here that you can see, we start off with a, uh, we proceed from the, uh, the lower left, and, and proceed clockwise, increasing uh, the C value uh, until the last C value we get that we use is, is 1.24, which is not as high as I would expect. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can see that the, the, that the randomness uh, is decreasing and the amount of symmetry is increasing. Uh, this, is, this looks fair, oops. Keep doing that. Unfortunately, the the arrow button is right near the forwarding button. So uh, you can see that the the sizes here are somewhat similar to the sizes for this the Sierpinski gasket uh, down here. And what what is uh, what is more telling is the is the fractal dimension that we can calculate. Remember, the fractal dimension is uh, two divided by c. So it starts out high over here, decreases slightly, keeps decreasing, and then uh, compare, this is uh, 1.6, whereas the dimension of the Sierpinski is 1.58, which is, is fairly close. So 
it's, it's appearing that we're getting uh, close to the limit there. And this is borne out by uh, experimentally in that we can't make C values uh, that are higher work that is the, the algorithm always halts for this particular case. So that shows uh, three examples where increasing the C value increases the, the symmetry. And, uh, and actually that's the, that's the end of the symmetry festival lecture. But I knew I'd have a little extra time, so I just showed some, some other patterns, maybe to get some fill in the background. And uh, it turns out that, that this, this algorithm, which is quite simple, and the examples that I've shown are, are all, have all been quite simple, but there are more complex examples with uh, a lot of restrictions removed, and it's, the algorithm still works. For example, the boundary region doesn't have to be connected or even simply connected, and nor do the motifs. The motifs can be uh, unconnected, uh, and they can have holes in them. And we can, we can apply uh, random rotations or random orientations to the, well, we can apply uh, regular orientations or random orientations to the motifs. Algorithm still works. Uh, we can even use, uh, we can even cycle through, say, a fixed number of motifs. Uh, and I don't have an example here, but we even have an example of blobs where uh, all the blobs are different and it still works. The only thing that's, that connects everything together is that, is that in all of the examples, the sizes of the motifs follow that area rule. And then uh, uh, recently we've, we've extended this idea to so-called wallpaper groups that is two-dimensional uh, crystal graphic groups. And um, here, the region R just becomes a, a fundamental region for one of those wallpaper groups. And then we apply the transformations, the isometries of the, the wallpaper group in order to tile the plane with these, uh, with these patterns. And the result is we, have, we get something with global uh, a global symmetry of the wallpaper group, but which is locally uh, fractal in nature. And this is, uh, this is a sample that we did, I guess, uh, almost two years ago now. Uh, of, it doesn't show too well, but, but each of those uh, red and blue circles is actually a yin-yang, uh, a shaded yin-yang itself. And so here, the, here we see the, the the yin and the yang, uh, each filled with circles, and each of those circles themselves has a yin-yang pattern in it. And in fact, this has this pattern has 180 degree rotational color symmetry about the center. You can see that this circle is the same size as this circle. This is the same size as this circle, and so forth. Uh, this 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 example in this example is an interesting example. Uh, the, the motif is, is this circle uh, with two semicircular arcs that cut out the center, which is then colored white. And uh, this, the, this inner circle then uh, is a target for future circles. And so we have eyes within eyes within eyes. But we only put pupils in the eyes that uh, don't contain other eyes. So it's only the so-called smallest circle, innermost circles that have pupils in them. This is an example of a, of a non-simply connected motif. And this is an example uh, using different orientations, basically three different orientations of, of um, well, actually these are all uh, rhombi and the orientations are uh, displaced by 120 degrees. Uh, notice that the, the C value is it's the highest of any pattern that I've ever seen. The only example I know that it's over 1.5. And uh, the, 
Well, it, it's, a, it's interesting to me. It looks like a Mediterranean, a, a picture of, a, of roofs in a Mediterranean village. This is a, uh, another sample of, of different orientations. In this case, the, the, the orientations are, are completely random, and the, uh, uh, the peppers are, are colored in the, these are supposed to be hot peppers, and so colored in the, pep, the, the kinds of colors that you would see. Now, the, this pattern is also uh, interesting in that it is, it is the fundamental region for a C1 crystallographic pattern, the most basic one. It repeats in two different directions. Probably one of the most, oops, go back here. Probably one of the most easy one to see is this pepper here is actually con 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 continued across the bottom to this pepper here. Uh, and similarly, this orange pepper here is continued on this size. In fact, its tail ends up there. And in fact, uh, there's this big red pepper that overlaps the corner, and you can see pieces of it in all four corners. So this, this pattern could be used to make a wallpaper. And then this is an example where we use different, uh, different motifs. Moreover, the motifs are not simply connected, at least some of them. Uh, they have holes in them. This is an example where, where we have uh, uh, two different motifs and the motifs are not connected. One of the motifs is the word bug, the other is fix. Uh, obviously, my uh, colleague had a lot of trouble with the program. Uh, and uh, here is an example where the, the regions uh, are not simply connected, not connected, or simply connected and are filled in. Uh, this is an example with a, a, a wallpaper pattern with more uh, color symmetry. Well, not color symmetry, but more symmetry. Actually, uh, I think there are uh, 12 fold points. Uh, let's see, at least this is a six fold point here. It's only going to be six fold rotation. Yeah, six fold rotational, but I believe that, that, that they're also reflection lines. That, yeah, that's a 12 fold. Yeah, so that is 12 fold, yeah. Uh, so that's the most complicated uh, one of those that we've done so far. And just for, because people are going to ask, here's an example, a three-dimensional example. Interesting, some of those, uh, if you look carefully, some of the toria are linked and others are not. And there's a lot of interesting things to do about this. One, we, one important thing for symmetry is we want to find uh, very symmetric patterns uh, for which we could uh, theoretically commute the, the fractal dimension of a regular pattern and approximate that regular pattern with, with our uh, patterns with high C values. And we're, we're still working on the 17 uh, crystallographic groups and coming up with algorithms that work for those. And I guess that's it. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Dury and all the other Symmetry Festival organizers. My contact information is there. And now I'll take questions. I was wondering in terms of the uh, fill, for example, that yin yang yeah. that you showed covered the surface, I think it was 91%. Right. Um, is there some way that you can see what the maximum fill would be? Like if you did some, well, maybe yeah. subject it to, uh, some, to the calculus or to some variation? Yeah. The question is, uh, what is the, the maximum fill? Well, the maximum fill is 100% because this, the algorithm keeps theoretically keeps going. And in fact, in the algorithm, one of the stopping conditions could be the percent fill. And we, we do have to have a stopping position of condition because we don't go to infinity. Yeah, but you're always going to have some space between circles, right? So, so, um, That's so a subtlety, things. yeah, that we... We actually built that in uh, the, to make the circles just a little bit, to put a little more extra space around each circle so the circles never actually touched. And amazingly, the algorithm still continues. So my, my point is that if you 
you had a general functional form which says uh, for any system of circles, this is what the coverage would be. And you can ask, well, where, where, do, you, where do you get a coverage if that's the maximum? I don't, I don't know how to, whether that's easy or difficult to do. Uh, yeah, well, the, the Hurwitz data function is a, is a difficult function to find the inverse of. But theoretically, you could. And that would tell you how many uh, circles to put in in order to get a percent, particular percentage of fill. I mean, we, we just do it the cheap way. We just keep track of the amount of area we've used so far, divide it by the total area, and see what that is. Yes. First, I think for the Hurwitz function, the, I the very the, first slide, a, a, a condition was missing so that the first term is not zero. Uh, oh. But that's a minor thing, but I wanted to... No, no, the, the question is... What I was dreaming about is the following. If you have your circles, if yeah. you use a circle inversion, oh. you get a new circle, and your original circle is also a circle where you can put the original subdivision in. So by circle inversion, you can immediately double the number of circles. And then again, double and double. Right, yes. So yeah. you could perhaps start with just two circles, double and double. Oh, well, yeah, the question is we can in increase the number of circles. Well, here's an even better idea. What we do is let our algorithm go and stop at 91% or whatever, and then take that picture and put it inside each of our circles yeah. and do that iteratively. <laughs> yeah, sure. We haven't done that, but yes. Other questions? Any of your pictures have artistic value as well? Yeah. Have you already presented on some fine art exhibitions? Uh, are we, yes, we do. We uh, present at, uh, <coughs> at Bridges, and uh, we have uh, two of our patterns that are going to be at this Bridges. Uh, we've all also presented at the, joint, the U.S. Joint Mathematical uh, Meeting, and uh, my colleague has, uh, has presented at local art exhibits. And that, Aesthetic considerations are, are top of our mind also, yes. We could also present it for ophthalmologists and colorblind to, to see how many circles can you see. Right, yes, yeah. Michael Vichy, if the place of circle, is it something other, ellipse? Oh, uh, can we use ellipses? Oh, we, we can use ellipses either for uh, the enclosing region, or for the motifs, or both. Yeah, this, the algorithm is quite flexible. We can fill, fill circles with squares, we can fill squares with circles. But it's not symmetric. Circle is uh, quite symmetric. The circle is quite symmetric, <coughs> and that is useful, that, it proves more useful in uh, creating wallpaper patterns. But the peppers are tiny. Like that, right? I mean, they're yeah, the, the, except less Right, the peppers are less symmetric. Could you say uh, something about uh, the division of labor between yourself and, and Mr. Shire? Oh, uh, the division of labor. Uh, oh, I guess it's about 95% Shire. <laughs> no, I, but, but I've been working with him, and, and I say, well, why don't you try to do this? He said, oh, I never thought about that. That happens. For example, that yin-yang, uh, the uh, blue and red yin-yang pattern, that was my idea. But he's the one that coded it. Other questions? Okay, thank you.
like to introduce Takashi Yoshino. Yes. Uh, he is going to talk about uh, projections of future patterns onto uh, hyperbolas. Thank you. I am Takashi Yoshino uh, of Toyo University from Japan. My presentation is. Features of the Poincare disk is the, hypo, um, the geometric curves, uh, sorry, geodesic curves on the um, hyper, hyperbolic surface and are uh, transformed into arcs. And any angles consisted by two geometric curves uh, on the hyperboloid are uh, conserved on the Poincare disk. Escher's uh, circle limit 1, 3, and 4 into hyperbolic surfaces. Mm. The method is very simple. Mm. The, um, uh, I prepared the 2D, two-dimensional images, um, digital images, and the each pixel transformed to um, transformed Onto the onto upper hyperbolic. This 
is an uh, uh, equation for transformation. And this is an uh, example of circle limit 1, circle limit 3, and circle limit 4. I uh, saved the 3D image using the format 3DS5. And, um, I allocated the 3, 3DS files on, the, on our servers. You can see uh, various viewpoint and various magnifications. This is a circle limit one. Uh, this is circle limit two, uh, circle limit three. Uh, uh, lost. <laughs> Very large magnification. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the. <laughs> <laughs> I also you know, transferred the Coxeter print uh, onto hyperbolic surfaces. The Coxeter print is the tiling of two, minor, two, two mirror symmetrical triangles whose angles are uh, pi over b pi over q and pi over r. I refer such tiling to pqr. This is an example of 6 to 4, the uh, motif of circle limit. Of Circle limit four. The, uh, the each triangle, um, each triangle, each patterns, each patterns must be satisfied with uh, relationship because the sum of inner angle of hyperbolic triangle must be uh, less than pi. Firstly, I I I draw um, this triangle. So this triangle can be written using the uh, hyperbolic law of cosines and the uh, position vector um, um, and uh, other formulas of hyperbolic geometries. That is the uh, position vector. After drawing fast circles, fast circles, uh, I um, the neighbor's triangles, like this. Now, I calculated the new bat, new bat, new vertex with the symmetrical point with respect to the each edges. This point goes to this point and this point goes to this point and so on. And repeat, mm. and then next we chose another triangle and like uh, and uh, calculate other vertices, vertices uh, other position vector vertices. Then mm. I can mm, obtain the mm, three dimensional pattern of Coxeter prints. This is example of 334, and this is example of 832, the motif of circle limit 3, and this is the 624. 
I also converted the, these patterns into 3D files. We can compare the two images like ah, it's not a good example. <laughs> I want to see uh, these two patterns uh, with, uh, on the on one, one view from from same viewpoint. So so um, uh, I prepare the overlapped image of eight three two and six two four. This is an overlapped image of uh, SR circle limit 3 and cock setter print of 824. We can view this three dimensional pattern from various points and various magnifications. Circle limit, circle limit four. Ah, sorry, um, I can look. <laughs> circle limit four. That's all. <laughs> this is my concluding remarks. I think this approach is a new appreciation of circle limit especially for the people who have geometrical interest. Thank you very much for your attention. For your attention. squares on the outside, ah, yes. would it be possible to do some sort of like combination of what you're doing computing the triangles yes, yes. with the Escher design yes. to actually reflect the fish into the smaller positions and get more resolution? Have you tried anything like that? Yes. In my work, uh, I chose a simple, simple two-dimensional images. This consists of the uh, same size of pixels. Right. Uh, uh, the uh, Poincaré disk is uh, described uh, from described from uh, center to infinity. Infinity. So uh, the, around the rim of the circle, uh, the uh, small small size of Pixel, uh, the pixel describes the large area. Right. No, I, I understand that. What I'm what I'm asking is, is there a way? So you've taken the entire image and projected, uh, yes, yes, yes. and for that reason, those uh, 
outline pixels get it's big it's and it's good. chunky. Would it be possible for you to form those outer fish yes. by literally reflecting the better resolution yes. of the good, inner fish? That's a good, good, good idea. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd be curious I, to I, see. Uh, I, I firstly uh, chose the detailed uh, large pixel size image, but mm -hmm. my computer performance cannot allow the this display of uh, <laughs> the three dimensional image. So I chose. Uh, Small pixel size images. That is the reason of uh, uh, the uh, 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 not the detailed patterns. And as you say, that uh, the improved method is to select uh, the pixel size depending on the distance from the center. Yeah, yeah but, but I'm thinking in particular, I mean, like. Doug, you've, you've made... Like, yeah, but I mean, I know this is doable because you have done this. I think you're misunderstanding my question. So. Yeah, uh, but I think you're on to the idea of, of uh, changing the pixel size yes, as yes, you go yes. around. You have to make the pixels much smaller the farther around. Last and detailed from center to edge. Is that the improved method? It improves it. Right. It takes longer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I thought. Yes, uh, other questions? You cannot, you, can, yeah. Yeah. you cannot take just any hyperbola. No? How did it work again? I, I only take uh, this equation only. The, uh, the improvement of any to any su uh, hyperbolic surface is uh, easy. <laughs> This one, and this one, and this one, and uh, this one, this and this one. I did not allocate uh, the overlapped image because uh, I forgot it. <laughs> it. It was the answer yes? Yes, the answer is yes, but he, uh, don't, he, he has the separate ones, but not the overlap. Oh, I see. Maybe in the future the overlap ones? Yeah, okay, uh, I, I will put that uh, <laughs> as soon as possible. Okay, I have a question. Uh, an easy question. Can you do circle limit two? Ah, I'm not interested in circle limit two. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's a very simple pattern. Yes, so. yes, very simple pattern. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the cross, cross, cross. cross. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, let's thank you again. Thank you very much. I guess we reconvene at 4 o'clock for $1,600. <laughs>